So it turns out that throughout the whole of English history, we have been known by everyone else in the world as arrogant and people who drink too much. Seems about right. What is good YouTube? My name is Ash Porter and welcome to my channel. Today I am well excited because I'm sharing with you a quality book, a good old bit of history and specifically English history. This is The History of England Volume 1 Foundation by Peter Aykroyd. Now, you probably won't know this because I haven't featured, I don't think, any history books yet on this channel. But I promise you that in the non-fiction category, history is actually normally my favourite sort of genre to read. I just love learning about what has happened, the stories that have been told, what has like happened to get us to this point where we are now in history. Plus, there's so much we can learn from history, obviously. We don't always choose to learn, but at least we can know about history. However, I realized that I had gone absolutely ages without really digging into a good history book. So I thought it was about time and what better place to start and kick my sort of 2021 history reading off by finally learning about the full history of England. So this book is actually part of a five or maybe even six part series that Peter Ackwood has written on the full history of England. And yes, when I say England, I mean specifically England, not Britain, because he, he to be fair, he's pretty honourable in the way he says that if I try to include Scotland and Wales, I just wouldn't do it justice and these books would be three, four times as long. And so he specifically focuses on England so he can give it his full attention and not discredit any other histories. Now, being English, or particularly being an English football fan, I'm aware that England isn't necessarily everyone's favorite country. Or at least the people of England aren't everyone's favorite people. I mean, people love coming to visit England, to see our sites, to experience our culture, but they don't necessarily, oh, I think this may be a mass generalization, but people seem to have a thing against England. Even like our neighbors, uh, our friends part of Britain seem to have just an in, insane rivalry against us. You know, they absolutely want to batter us at sport. People hate when England do well at anything. And I think as well, probably one problem is, and I kind of said it in the intro, but most people think us English people like proper up ourselves and think that we're better than everybody else, which to be fair, I know a lot of people, probably including myself, who at times we can be proper up ourselves. So maybe that's true. But despite this, it's important that we as humans, we know our history, know where we came from, uh, the, the nations we belong to, how they got to where they are. And so for me, as someone who's English, I felt like it's important to really start learning this stuff. Now, this first book, starts about 15,000 years ago, telling us the little bits of information we can know about ancient life in England through things like archeology. span But kind of obviously, 15,000 years ago, people weren't writing down, recording everything that they were going on, kind of like in more recent history. And so actually it's much harder to know exactly what was going on 15,000 years ago compared to maybe 500 years ago. So Ackroyd kind of zooms over sort of maybe 12,000 years, roughly covering what life might have been like in the ancient world in those like original people who were inhabiting England. But then it kind of starts getting serious about 3,000 years ago. This book covers huge time spans. It starts 15,000 years ago and ends right at the end of the 15th century at the start of the Tudor reign. This is a humongous time span. However, do not be intimidated. Do not think that this is gonna be like just too much to take in. There's so much to read and consume. I think actually, Ackroyd does a really, really good job in allowing this book to be accessible, covering the necessities and making it clear. 
I think also the reason that in this first book, you know, out of six, that such a huge time span is covered is the fact that actually there's just so much more material and understanding of the last, like the most recent 500 years since the time of the Tudors than that was before that. And so there's just so much more information to work with and he can delve deeper into the last 500 years. Whereas all sort of the time before that, there's much less recorded history. And so his job is probably harder. But I guess also, from what I understand, and obviously as I read this series, I'm gonna get to grips with it more, but actually before sort of 500 years ago, England was kind of a backwater nation where it had a lip like, a little bit of medieval prestige, you know, it went on a few crusades that were pretty grim, but really it was a nation that people didn't particularly care about. It didn't have a big effect on the wider world, whereas in more recent history, we really started to have an effect on the world. And so it probably means our history becomes more relevant. Despite this though, and like I said earlier, Aykroyd's work is top draw. He is engaging and easy to read and he shapes these incredible narratives throughout history. And what I also love is that he doesn't just focus on the elite and the monarchy, which can be so often just covered in history, everyone else forgotten, but he tries with the little bits of information he's found to give a taste of what the life was like for your everyday person. You know, there are little chapters scattered throughout the book about what your everyday citizen would be doing, what it would be like to be a farmer, a peasant, um, all that kind of stuff. And I really appreciate that because it like gives you a broader sense of the time and history. But equally, he lays out the history of our nation through the ruling powers, which is so often covered. And let's be honest, it is important. You know, our nation for most of its life was exploited and colonized by foreign powers. Whether it was the Romans, the Vikings, the Germanic tribes, the French or whoever, we were constantly being colonized, settled in, and there was a constant fight for power. You know, our history is one of constant battle. The History of England Volume 1 really is a great book. I really recommend it to start delving into the history of our nation. Or if you're not English, still it's a great way to start learning about England if you are interested. So I cannot recommend it. And let's delve into some of the key things I learned. As usual, these books, they are so rammed full of good information and they are so um, engaging and enjoyable and they can only really be appreciated if you give it a read yourself. I can tell you all about it and I, I know you can learn stuff from this video, but as always, I really recommend go pick yourself up a copy if you're interested because it is worth your time. What I think was one of the biggest things that stood out to me from this book and that I've learned, and I, would, I, I knew it a little bit, like a tiny, I had fragments of information about this, but this really kind of confirmed this for me, that it's incredible how colonized England has been. And I think particularly, you know, what strikes me is the fact that most people who call themselves English, if they go back far enough in their history and their genealogy, they probably aren't native to England, but actually, have deep roots throughout the rest of Europe. From what I understand, and I may have this wrong, but I think I've got this right, like only really the Welsh, the Scottish, like those, you know, their genetics go far back in those regions of those countries, and also those people who have like lived in Cornwall for absolutely forever, really they are the only ones who can say they're native to this island of ours. Like, um, even, I say Ireland, you know, back in the day, believe it or not, England wasn't an island, it was attached to Europe. You could walk from Europe to England. And from what I understand is that throughout history, there's, at different time periods, uh, streams of people came from Europe to England, from, you know, different areas in Germany. It wasn't Germany at the time, and France, and even, like, the sort of Scandinavian countries before the Viking invasions, that kind of stuff, they came to England at different times, whether they were, like, refugees because sea levels were rising and they could no longer live where they were, 
or just escaping war or just trying to find new fertile land. They came and inhabited a lot of especially southern England. Think about that. A lot of our ancestors were probably literally displaced refugees. But then eventually the Romans came and we kind of know that they wanted to take over. They wanted to uh, bring Roman civilization, law, infrastructure to everywhere they went. And eventually they came to our little island and it kind of pushed the like Cornish people, the Welsh and the Scottish back into sort of the land areas that we now know as Scotland, Wales, Cornwall. And the Roman civilization kind of took over the rest of England. Some of the local inhabitants stayed, started to become part of Roman civilization. But like I said, from what I understand, a lot of them retreated and are now part of those other nations. But then in about 540, you know, AD, something absolutely crazy happened. This really like horrific plague, some kind of calling it a kind of like bubonic plague, that kind of stuff, started in Egypt and spread throughout the whole of the Roman Empire. However, when it got to England, it did this really weird thing where it only really affected the native people. So let's say you have the Welsh, Scottish, the Cornish, they retreated into their, um, their countries, their land, that kind of stuff now. And then you have the Roman civilization over England. And then suddenly the local population basically gets mostly wiped out by this plague, leaving hardly any real native English people. That's crazy. Only really the European settlers, those who weren't actually native to England, survived. Like I think it says in the book that the population they estimate before the plague was about three to four million people in England. Whereas after the plague, it went down to just one million. That's like three quarters of the native population of England was just destroyed, their lines gone. So the amount of truly native English people at that point had to be minuscule. And then after that, and from those ashes, uh, kind of rose uh, people groups that we know as the Saxons and the Angles, again, they came from Europe, they settled the land and they spread throughout England to later mix together and be known as the Anglo-Saxons. And I just find this interesting, the fact that actually, there is probably hardly any if any, 100% English people, like most of us, the ancestors that we will talk about, who, you know, they did become English, the English people, but they were the Anglo-Saxons. They weren't natives to this land. They came from Europe. And so I think this, for me, I just find this so interesting. And it's definitely interesting in our world now, where, you know, we talk about, oh, I'm English, and people can be so discriminatory based on that, when actually I just don't think historically there's any root for that. You know, the reality is the English historically were migrants, refugees, and a colonized people. Then the, a quick second and final thought from me, like I said, to get the most out of it, go read this book. But my final thing I wanna share is that when I read this book, and you kind of know it a little bit, because in like primary school, you get you start getting taught about all these horrible kings and queens. But actually, the absolute power throughout our history and most of the world's history that like monarchy had, they just used it so badly, and it so exemplifies that absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, from what I pick up reading this book, I think it's kind of clear that Aykroyd, he isn't a massive fan of the monarchy. You know, he loves writing about the history, but I mean, he slates most of the kings in this book. You know, one real example of this is Richard the Lionheart, and um, the sort of the king that was around during the Third Crusade, who fought against Saladin in the Holy Lands, who like this Robin Hood figure is often, like mythology is often associated with and all this kind of stuff. For me, growing up, he was kind of like a cult hero. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but Disney back in the day made this Robin Hood film and like, um, where it's all animals, you might see it, it's on Disney Plus if you wanna watch it. And Richard the Lionheart was like made out to be this big brave king warrior who was like stood for all things good. And so for so long in my mind, I've been like, yeah, all the other kings, they probably sucked, but Richard the Lionheart, 
You know, he was my guy. But this book just kind of destroyed that a little bit. You know, from, from what I understand in this book, right from when William the Conqueror, a foreign invader, came and conquered um, England and stole the crown and the sort of the Normans became a ruling class in England right up until really the time of the Tudors. Pretty much all the monarchs of England were way more interested in Normandy and all those different regions of France rather than England. England was just a backwater country where they could gain power and they could tax it so heavily so that then they could go to war and try and take other lands in Europe. That's what they were interested in. And unfortunately, Richard the Lionheart was no different. These kings, they didn't really care about anyone else except themselves and their reputation. Like, you know, when we think about kings, historically we think about people who were meant to govern, people who were meant to inspire their nation and their populations, when really they couldn't give a crap. Like, they just cared about their wealth, their reputation, and the power that they could hold. It's a bit of a shame, really. England, you know, this glorious nation where actually, for basically 500 years, its kings cared more about other countries than itself. It's a bit sad. But as previously mentioned, that was just England's reality. Before, you know, the sort of rise of the Industrial Revolution and English colonialism in the sort of last 400 years, England didn't mean a lot. It wasn't a big nation, it didn't have a lot going for it. But in these future books we're going to read about how that did change. And there we go, that's basically Two key things I've taken away from this book. There is so, so, so much more. If you read it, there'll be other stuff which stands out to you. Go grab yourself a copy if you wanna learn more about English history. I really recommend this book. And that has been it. I have been Ash Porter. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you next time.